Good evening. My name is Keith Cole, and I'm the executive director for the Wolf River Conservancy. I want to welcome you all here tonight for our summer lecture series, Bats of the Southeast. This is an ongoing part of our environmental education program. We want to thank our presenting sponsors for this year's summer lecture series. Our corporate sponsor is Buckman. Our foundational sponsor is the Crawford Howard Family Foundation. We also want to acknowledge and thank all of our benefactors, starting with AutoZone, Bank of America, Brother International, FedEx, the Hyde Family Foundations, the Griffles Foundation, International Paper, Ring Container Technology, and Chris Hill Construction. All of our supporters, individual donors and volunteers are of course very important to us in delivering on our mission, which is to protect and enhance the Wolf River and its watershed as a sustainable natural resource. Thank you all for your support. During the night uh, in the chat box, there'll be a link that will allow you to make a gift if you wish to do so. And we would certainly appreciate that as always. Thank you for all your support. You can always visit wolfriver.org to look at all the activities that we offer throughout the year, including this year's activation activities on the Greenway. We invite you to do that. And if you have questions, please share those with us. Some housekeeping details. For tonight, we ask that you not video or record any of this session on any device. Also, if you have questions during the evening, if you'll use the Q&A feature, uh, our Director of Education, Kathy Justice, will be monitoring those questions and she'll be presenting those at the end of our presentation. We're very excited tonight to have Becky Roseman, uh, who is a wildlife biologist, as our presenter. She will highlight bat species found in the state of Mississippi, where she works for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. She'll be discussing basic bat biology, bat diseases, and other threats to bats. Becky is a native of Maryland. She received a BS in forestry and in wildlife with a concentration in wildlife sciences from Virginia Tech in 1994 and a master's in science in biology from Towson University in 1998. She moved to Mississippi in 2001 and has worked for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service since 1999. She is currently a refuge biologist at North Mississippi Refuge Complex in Grenada, managing refuge lands for wildlife, primarily overwintering waterfowl and conducting various population surveys. Since 2010, Becky has been the chair of the Mississippi Bat Working Group, which supports bat conservation efforts through education and research. Again, we're very happy tonight to have Becky. Please join us in welcoming Becky. Becky, thank you for being with us. We look forward to your program. Thank you, Keith. And I'd just like to thank everybody for joining us tonight or joining me, um, us tonight to learn about uh, bats. So I'm gonna try to share my screen right now. And we'll go ahead and get started. Maybe, there we go. Um, so I'm gonna start off with just some general characteristics of bats, um, basic biology, and then I'll focus more um, on our uh, local bats, go over some of their life history characteristics, threats that they face, and then some of the things that we can do to actually help them. And so starting at the very basic level, bats are mammals. And as mammals, they share um, certain characteristics with all other mammals, including that they're vertebrates, meaning they have a backbone. Um, they, their bodies are covered with hair or fur. They're endotherms or warm blooded, meaning that their body temperatures are controlled primarily through metabolic processes. And they have live young and their females will feed their young milk. Now bats are unique among other mammals in that they are the only mammal that is truly capable of flight. So our flying squirrels don't really fly, they glide. Um, and so only bats can truly fly. Bats are members of the order Chiroptera. And if you take a look at this bat's wing and compare it to your own um, arm, this is the forearm, the radius and the ulna. Then they have a thumb, first, second, third, and fourth fingers. And those 
fingers on a bat are very elongated and have skin stretched between to form the wing, um, which is why they're named hand wing. Um, so they really fly with their hands. Breaking that down further, there's two suborders of bats, the megachiroptera or the megabats and the microchiroptera or microbats. The megachiroptera are primarily our flying foxes. Um, they do not use echolocation. Um, they're herbivores and they have very, very good eyesight, which they use to um, locate their food and navigate. The microchiroptera in uh, comparison use echolocation and most are carnivores, although there are some microchiroptera that feed on fruit or nectar. Um, and all of our bats are microchiroptera. Looking at the extremes, um, either end of the, the spectrum, the uh, bats range in size from the smallest, which is about two grams, to the largest, which is a almost 1600 grams or about 3.5 uh, pounds. And they range wingspan wise from six inches to um, almost six feet. One of the largest is the Bismarck flying fox, which is found in New Guinea and Indonesia. And um, it's actually the heaviest species of bat weighing in at the three and a half pounds. Um, it has a wingspan of up to five feet, five inches. There are a couple species that get just a little bit larger wingspan wise, but not quite as heavy. Um, interestingly, these flying foxes will form colonies of, with several thousand individuals. So you can just imagine how intimidating that would be to go by a roost of several thousand bats with almost six foot wide wingspans. Um, but in any case, that's the largest species um, found in the world or one of the largest. And the smallest is the bumblebee bat, which is found in Thailand and um, Myanmar. Um, they weigh only two grams. And for our younger viewers, that's about the weight of two Skittles, just to kind of put that in perspective. And again, have a wingspan of about six inches. Bats are found worldwide um, with over 1400 species. That makes them the second um, most diverse mammal group. And they're second only behind rodents. And they account for about 20% of all mammalian species. They are distributed pretty much in all zones except or all regions except for the polar regions. So the red on this map shows where bats can be found. They have a number of adaptations, um, primarily for flight and related to flight. We've already talked about the elongated um, finger bones that form their wing. Um, they also have a recurved claw on their thumb, which helps with um, movement and, and um, hanging on. And one of the adaptations specific for flight is a reduced pelvic girdle. This lightens their overall body weight, um, which makes flight possible. When bats are roosting, they generally are roosting in a head down position. And in order to achieve that position, their hind limbs are actually rotated 180 degrees um, compared to how our, our hind or our legs are, are oriented. Um, additionally, when they are hanging on, their tendons lock in place. So they can roost without any effort at all. And then when they're ready to um, take off, they just simply have to release their grip and, and can go on their way. Many bats also have specialized facial features and most of these are related to what they're feeding on. And so our, the first two pictures down here are um, insect eating microbats. The first is a hoary bat um, and it is an active forager. So it's gonna swoop through the air and catch insects on the wing. And if you look at its ears, um, most bats that, ha that echolocate have a structure called a tragus and the tragus will be various shapes um, in order to aid in echolocation. If you look at the raffinus bigard bat in this picture, you can see the huge ears um, and it is actually more of a gleaner. So rather than um, catching insects on the wing, which it can do, it will also fly more slowly and pick bugs off of um, vegetation as it goes along. Many of our uh, microbats for echolocation also have specialized structures on their noses. 
Now this third picture is one of the flying foxes and most species that feed on either nectar or fruit will have elongated noses um, and the fruit eaters generally will have very powerful jaws to crush their fruit. Um, megabats also as a rule have smaller ears in proportion to their size and no tragus because they don't use echolocation. And then the final picture is um, a vampire bat. They've got several specialized facial features. The first is their nose, which is um, sensitive to heat. Their front incisors are um, larger than many other microbats and um, are very, very sharp. And then their tongue actually has a groove in it to help with feeding. If you look at uh, bat diets, they're pretty varied. Um, all of our microbats in Mississippi are insect eaters. And um, in addition to feeding on insects, they'll, they'll feed on some other invertebrates as well, um, but they, they do feed primarily on insects. There are, of course, fruit eating bats we mentioned, nectar feeding bats, and then a specialized diet would be the vampire bat, which feeds on blood. Now, out of the over 1,400 species of bats, only three species are vampire bats. And um, all three of these are located in um, either Central or South America or Mexico. There are none that are found in the United States. A, more, a few more unique diets um, include this bulldog bat, which feeds on fish, which it catches with its elongated um, hind feet and finds using echolocation. And then there's, there's also some bats that will feed on frogs. Um, there's even species that will feed on lizards, um, birds, and e even other small bats. So bat diets are varied just depending on the species. Okay, so moving on and focusing more on Mississippi bats. As I mentioned before, all of our Mississippi bats are uh, microchiroptera. Um, so they're using echolocation and they're feeding on insects. Um, they range in size from four to 35 grams. Um, and again, just to put it in perspective, a nickel weighs five grams. So our smallest bats are a little bit, weigh a little bit less than a nickel. Um, and the largest bats that we have in the area have a wingspan of up to 16 inches. Now I mentioned that they do find their food using echolocation. It doesn't work exactly like this, but you kind of get the idea. Um, bats will essentially send out a high frequency pulse as they're flying along. That pulse will go out. When it hits an object, it will bounce back. The bat can hear that echo and um, from that echo can determine the size and shape of whatever that those sound waves hit. The the location, the direction and speed it's moving, and it helps the bat determine whether or not it's a prey item. If it, if it is a prey item, as the bat approaches, it will begin to call more and more frequently um, to help home in on exactly where that um, prey item is until the, the bat is able to capture it. Most of our bats will only have one pup per year there are a few species that um, have more than, than one um, and even as many as five at one time, but that's pretty unique. Like I said, most of them will only have one pup per year. Um, most breeding will occur in the fall or winter, but bats have delayed fertilization, so the females don't actually become pregnant until the springtime. Um, females will typically form maternal colonies. Um, and those colonies can range in size, again, depending on the species, from just individual bats to thousands of bats in a, in a single colony. And these colonies usually form in April and then will disperse at the end of the summer as the bats get ready to move into their hibernacula. Um, frequently, females will um, form these maternal colonies in the same roost year after year. And just for clarification, maternal colonies consist of just the females and their young, um, not males. Males will go off and either roost um, by themselves or form bachelor colonies. Most species will um, give birth from early May through June. 
And when pups are born, they have no fur and are completely reliant on the female. But they develop very, very quickly, and most are able to fly in within four or five weeks. Um, evening bats, one of our common species, can actually fly when they're about 20 days old. Um, but for the majority of species, it's between four to five weeks. And then um, they actually will be weaned several weeks after they are able to fly. So for the first few weeks that they're flying, they're still um, nursing and getting milk from their mother. In the wintertime, um, bats can either hibernate or migrate. Generally down here, um, our bats will go into hibernation, but it tends to be a sh much shorter duration. Northern populations, you'll see um, more of that migration or hibernation in caves. During hibernation, um, the body temperature typically will drop to the, the air temperature of the hibernaculum and the heart rate will slow dramatically. So just to give you an idea of the um, normal heart rate, when a bat is at rest, not in torpor, but at rest, it, its heart rate is approximately 200 beats a minute. When it's flying, that heart rate increases to approximately a thousand beats a minute. So flight, it will increase by about five times. But when it goes into torpor or hibernation, the heart rate will drop to about 10 beats a minute. And so you can see the, the extreme range of, or variation in heart rate depending on the bat's activity. And all of this is keyed into um, conserving energy. During hibernation, a bat only has a few extra grams of fat that have to get it through all of hibernation. And up north, that may be a four to five month period. Now, during the normal course of hibernation, bats will um, rouse periodically. During this, this rousal period, the heart rate will accelerate, the body temperature will co come up, and then it will go back down. And I believe that occurs over about a 24 hour period. And then the, the bat will resume torpor um, for a period of time until that happens again. This becomes very important when we talk about white nose syndrome, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, at least for little brown bats, the um, typical um, spacing between these rousal periods is about two, two weeks. It could be a little bit longer, it could be a little shorter, but it averages about 14 or 15 days. Um, so, Within Mississippi, we have 15 species of bats, and I'm going to break them down. Um, well, of those 15 species, about eight of our species are what I would consider common in terms of how frequent, frequently we encounter them. And so I'm going to break those down by roost type. And so the first three species are, that I'm going to mention are Brazilian free-tailed bats, big brown bats, and evening bats. Um, all three of these species will use bat houses and can also be found in buildings. Um, now there are some, some differences in roost preferences. Um, Brazilian free-tailed bats, which is his first picture, and the big brown bats will both use um, culverts. And um, the Brazilian free-tailed bat will also use caves. Um, they're probably best known for populations in Carlsbad Cavern, New Mexico, and um, the uh, Congress Avenue Bridge in Austin, Texas. Um, under the bridge there, it's um, estimated that there's a population of about one and a half million Brazilian free-tailed bats, so pretty large population. Um, none of the other species that we have around here typically form colonies quite that large, and I don't know that we have any colonies quite that large in Mississippi either, but uh, Brazilian free-tailed bats can form very large colonies. Um, big brown bats and evening bats will also use um, hollow trees or roost under loose bark of trees. Um, and so there's a little bit of variation, but the important thing to remember with these three species in terms of roosts is that all three will come into buildings and can sometimes be a, a problem because of that. And 
on the plus side, they will use bad houses as well. Okay. Our evening, or I'm sorry, our Eastern red bat and Seminole bat, both of these species typically um, roost in trees and not in hollow trees. Instead, what they'll do is they'll roost out on the limbs of trees on the thin twigs where they'll grasp the twig itself with their feet and hang on usually right next to a leaf so that leaf can kind of um, hide it. Um, Seminole bats, the bat on the right, also will use um, Spanish moss. Um, they're frequently found roosting in Spanish moss. These, both of these species tend to be solitary, so you don't get maternal colonies forming. Um, during the maternity season, you just have the female with her, her pups. And um, it's not unusual for them to have multiple pups. Um, okay. Our next common species is a tricolored bat. Um, and tricolored bats are interesting because they have very different roost types depending on the season. Um, they're, they're also, um, well, I'll get into that later, I'm sorry. But they will in the wintertime be found in caves and culverts. And then during the summertime, they typically will roost in treetops in the foliage. So in, on the bottom left, you can see there's a picture of a um, maternal colony in, um, in a pine tree. Earlier on, on the slide that I had, um, talked about bat reproduction, that was also a colony of tricolored bats that happened to be roosting under the eaves of a porch, um, which usually we don't find tricolored bats around buildings, but in this case they did. Um, but like I mentioned, in the, in the wintertime, they're in caves and culverts and then use trees and uh, treetops in the maternity season. And then finally, our species that are most associated with bottomland hardwood forests, which are raffinus big-eared bats and southeastern bats. Um, both of these species are, are pretty well known for roosting in hollow trees. And you can sometimes get very large colonies form in some of these large cypress and tupelo trees. Um, this is a small grouping of um, southeastern bats. The raffinus big-eared bats in particular will sometimes use abandoned buildings as well. Um, they, both species will also use, um, culverts and caves, well, culverts in the wintertime, and, um, they will use caves as well. We've got three species that are federally listed currently. Um, these include the gray bat and Indiana bat that are listed as in, endangered. Um, for both these species, we're kind of at the edge of their range, um, and we don't have very many records for them at all. Um, but interestingly, in 2013 and then again in 2015, um, they radio tracked a um, females from a cave in Tennessee to Benton County, Mississippi, where they're, they um, roosted in a beaver pond. And we assume that there was a maternal colony there. We never were able to confirm it. Um, then we also have the northern long-eared bat, which is listed as threatened currently, although it's being um, reviewed for or reevaluated for listing as endangered. Um, we also do not have very many records for northern long-eared bats, um, but they're, they can sometimes be easily confused with southeastern bats. And so um, we're still working to try to find records for Northern Longyears in, in Mississippi. Another species um, that we consider common is being considered for um, listing right now, and that's the tricolored bat. And that's primarily a result of white nose syndrome and the impacts that white nose syndrome has had on that species. And then there's four species um, that we do not encounter very frequently. We have very, very few records for, um, and those are the hoary bat, the silver-haired bat, little brown bat, and northern yellow bat. Um, the silver-haired bat is probably primarily in Mississippi during migration and, and over winter. Um, and most of the research that's been done in the, in the state has happened during the summer. And so that probably explains a lot of the 
the lack of records for silver haired. Um, little brown bat, we have a few historical records. And again, that's another species where we're at the edge of the range. Um, Northern yellow bats were actually considered extirpated from the state. Um, we had no records since 1939, I believe. And then in 2018, there was one found along the coast in a shipyard. So we got to add that back to our list. But these are our four species that we don't frequently encounter. Now, what kind of threats do bats face? The, um, the most obvious, of course, is habitat destruction. If you cut down their roost tree or you know, um, pave over or fill in their cave and they don't have a, a roost, that's going to be detrimental. Um, but habitat degradation can be just as bad. So if folks discover a, a cave that has bats and they start using it as for campfires, that can make that cave um, unsuitable for bats. Um, they are also very susceptible to um, pollution or sensitive to pollution, whether it's water pollution or um, chemicals and pesticides that are used for other purposes, they can have an impact on bats as well. And sometimes by, by trying to, sometimes our, our best intentions go astray. And I'm thinking specifically in terms of ecotourism. You wanna educate people about bats to be able to show people bats, but bats are sensitive to disturbance. And so if you're not sensitive to when um, you're going into these areas or how much disturbance there is or what alterations you might make to the area in order to make it accessible to people, um, you may wind up ruining it for the bats. And so that, that does happen as well. There's also some cases where there's intentional eradication. I think for instance, people who have bats in their house, you can exclude bats, but in some cases, folks just call exterminators and get rid of them altogether. And so we wanna discourage that, encourage people to try to, um, uh, get the bats out of their house and, and help relocate them and it just exclude them from being able to get in there in the first place. In recent years, wind power had, oh, I'm sorry, going back to intentional eradication. Under that, I also lumped hunting. That's not so much an issue here, but in um, within the range of the flying foxes in, in particular, those bats are sometimes hunted actually for food and that can have an impact on the population as well. In recent years, wind power has become a threat to bats. Um, and it's not necessarily that the bats are getting hit by the, the um, turbine blades themselves, but as the turbine turns, it creates a vacuum. And if a bat enters that vacuum, it kills the bat. And so many of these wind farms wind up being put up in areas that bats move through, particularly on migration. And so that can definitely become an issue. And then there are several diseases that do have impacts on bats. Now, historically, when we think about bats and diseases, we would have thought about rabies. Um, and in general, rabies um, doesn't have a huge impact on bat populations as a whole. It is a concern for us in bats so that if you find a bat that's, that's acting abnormally, you find a bat in your house, you don't ever wanna pick it up barehanded. If you do have to, to handle it at all, which I don't recommend, but if you do have to handle it, you wanna make sure that you have heavy leather gloves. Um, and if there's ever any chance that somebody might've gotten bitten by that bat, it does need to be sent in for testing because rabies is fatal, there is no cure. So you don't want to, to mess around with that. But the reality is that only one tenth of 1% of all bats even have rabies. And so it's not something, like I said, that has a huge impact on the population. Um, a disease that does greatly impact the population or has had a huge impact on the population is white nose syndrome. Um, white nose syndrome is caused by the fungus Pseudogymnoascus destructans, which we abbreviate, thankfully, as PD. Um, and it thrives in cold, damp places like that hibernacula, the caves that they live in during the wintertime. Um, it's characterized by this white fungal growth on the nose, ears, and wing membranes. Pretty much any exposed skin may have this fungus. 
Now, not all bats um, are equally susceptible to white nose syndrome and not all bats that, that have the fungus on them actually show symptoms of white nose syndrome or get sick from it. The species that have been hardest hit include the northern long-eared bats, little brown bats, and tricolored bats. Um, in some colonies of these species, we'll find 100% mortality. Um, in many colonies of these species, the mortality rates will be 90% plus. And so these species are definitely suffering as a result of white nose syndrome. Now it was first discovered near Albany, New York in the winter of 2006, 2007. And since then it's spread across the US. Um, now looking, the, the colors on this map just show when, what year um, it got to very, or was detected in various places. In Mississippi, we have found the um, PD fungus, uh, both on bats and on the substrate where they're roosting but we have not yet found a bat that actually appears to have white nose syndrome. And we've not found any bats that appear to have died from it. And so we continue to monitor um, our bat populations in the wintertime. Um, our state bat biologist does um, hibernacula monitoring in caves in Mississippi. And then the Mississippi Bat Working Group actually holds a culvert blitz every year where in January, where we go and survey um, culverts throughout the state to try to get a, a count of individual bats that are using those culverts as a way to monitor the population. And the primary species that we pick up during the culvert blitz are the tricolored bats. Now, the, the way that um, white no, or the way the fungus actually um, affects the bats is it, it interferes with their torpor, with them staying in torpor. So there was a study done on little brown bats in 2012 that looked at the length of a torpor bout um, in bats that were not affected by white nose syndrome, bats that had white nose syndrome but made it through the winter, and bats that died from white nose syndrome during the winter. And they found that both the um, individuals that were not affected by white nose and those that survived the winter, even though they had white nose, had an average torpor bout length of about 15 days. Um, whereas those that died during the winter had an average uh, torpor bout length of about seven days. And that's shown in this top um, graph. Okay, these are the unaffected, had white nose syndrome, but made it through and die from white nose syndrome during the winter. The second graphs just show the um, body temperature on the y-axis over time. And this is an unaffected bat. This is one that died during the winter time. So you can see how frequently they were rousing during, um, during the winter and how their torpor bouts were much, much shorter than these guys that um, were not affected by white nose syndrome. Another um, disease or issue that's come to the forefront here in the last year and a half is coronavirus. Now, I am not an expert on coronavirus, but I wanted to give you just a little bit of background on coronaviruses in general, how they relate to bats, and um, what that means kind of for us and for our bats in North America. Um, and so just as a little bit of uh, background information, breaking it down, there's basically four genera of coronaviruses. And these are, and these are designated as alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. Now the gamma and delta coronaviruses are primarily coronaviruses associated with birds. Um, they will infect some mammals, but for the most part, they are bird coronaviruses. Alpha and beta coronaviruses are found in mammals. Um, there are four human coronaviruses that cause mild to moderate um, cold-like symptoms in humans. And two of these are alpha coronaviruses, two of these are beta coronaviruses. But then there's three coronaviruses, human coronaviruses 
that cause potentially severe um, symptoms. All three of these are beta coronaviruses, and the one that we're most interested in is the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus. That is the um, virus that led to the COVID-19 epidemic or caused the COVID-19 epidemic. Um, it's believed to have its origin in, the in a species of horseshoe bat in China, and that it was passed on to humans, not directly from the bat, but through an intermediate host. So it went from the bat to another mammal and then into humans. The concern is that um, this now human coronavirus will then be passed back to our North American bats and they can become reservoirs um, to then give it back to us. And so that's that's a one of the concerns with um, humans and bats and, and coronaviruses. Now, different species, well, there's been several studies, there's been a lot of studies now <laughs> over the last year, um, just increasingly more and more, looking at bats and coronaviruses. Um, one study that I just took a quick look at was um, just some testing by the National Wildlife Health Center of um, bats that had been sent in for various reasons, not for coronavirus, but they tested 121 bats um, and found an 8.3% occurrence of coronavirus in these bats. However, all of those coronaviruses were alpha coronaviruses. Um, again, remember the COVID or the SARS-CoV-2 um, coronavirus is a beta coronavirus. Um, and so there have been other studies that have shown that different species of bats will have different susceptibilities. So remember, we're, we have over 1,400 species of bats throughout the United or throughout the world, and not all of these species are going to react the same to the different coronaviruses. Last year, they did a, I think it was a literature review that looked at um, corona, the distribution of coronaviruses in bats worldwide and found that in temperate zone North American bats, so bats found in our area, they, the only coronaviruses that were ever reported or detected were alpha coronaviruses. Now, whether that was because these species of bats had never been um, exposed to beta coronaviruses or whether they were um, not susceptible to beta coronaviruses, we can't really say that. Um, but it, it is something else to consider. And then the last study I'm just going to mention briefly was, um, again, a study done last year where they inoculated big brown bats, which one of our species, um, they inoculated them with the SARS-CoV-2 virus um, and then monitored them for three weeks. And at the end of three weeks, there was no evidence of SARS-CoV-2 virus, um, no symptoms of any kind of disease, no indication that they had really even come into contact with it. Um, and so there's still a lot more research that needs to be done. We need to, to um, kind of keep all this in mind. If, if we're going to be working at bats, we need to, with bats, we need to make sure we take precautions um, to, to prevent the possibility, um, if it is even possible that they could, um, if they are susceptible to SARS-CoV-2. Um, one other thing is that, that bats do have very unique immune systems that allows them to, to act as reservoirs for different viruses, not all viruses, but some viruses, without actually develop, developing any um, ill effects or any symptoms or illness from the virus itself. Um, so. So that's, that's something to, to keep in mind as we progress forward. Now, why are bats important to us? Um, the, we, we get a lot of benefits from bats and not just, I mean, from my perspective, I just think bats are great and the world would, would be much um, less interesting if we didn't have bats. But some of the ecological services that they provide um, as, nectar feeders or, or nectar feeding bats um, 
actually pollinate plants while they are foraging. Um, there's over 530 species of bat of plants that um, rely on bats either as the only pollinator or the major pollinator. And these include plants such as saguaros, agave, cocoa, bananas, mangoes, and guavas. Um, these things are almost exclusively pollinated by bats. Um, bats also function as seed dispersers in um, the form of our fruit eating bats. When they eat the, the pulp of the fruit and they crush it up and, and swallow it, they swallow the seeds as well. When they move to another location and defecate, they're then planting those seeds um, and spreading the plant. Um, and so that's a, a huge benefit, particularly in tropical areas. Um, anybody that has been outside on a southern, in, in the south at night can appreciate bats just as um, mosquito eaters. <laughs> Um, we have more than our share of mosquitoes, and um, bats are tremendous predators on insects. Um, a study published in Science in 2001 actually estimated the economic value of bats to agriculture at about $3.7 billion a year. Um, I found other estimates that may even go as high as $53 billion a year. And so they, they can have a huge impact um, on the insect population. And it's especially important for our agricultural industry. Um, to put those numbers in another perspective, a single colony of 150 big brown bats can eat nearly 1.3 million insects in a year. So that's a lot of bugs. And then finally, um, it's not an ecological benefit, but vampire bats have um, contributed a good bit to um, to the medical field. They have um, several different chemicals in their saliva, which help with their feeding. Um, one of those is a vasodilator, so it relaxes the blood vessels. And it's been used to develop treatments for hypertension, heart failure, um, kidney diseases, and burns um, in humans. And then the saliva also contains anticoagulants um, and those have been used to develop a blood clot dissolving drug, which they named Draculin, very appropriately. As I mentioned earlier, bats do have a very unique immune system that allows them to be reservoirs of viruses without having any symptoms. And so scientists are studying bats' immune system and um, hope to gain insight into human diseases, including cancers. Um, so there's a lot of, of benefits that we get from bats. And so it's in our best interest when we can to help bats. And so just a few things that we can do to um, help bats. One is just to kind of be aware of where bats are, where they're roosting. If it's a hibernation, uh, hibernaculum or a maternity colony, try to avoid disturbing those. That's when they're the most vulnerable. That's also when you have um, the largest groupings of a particular species which means that any disturbance will have a greater impact than if you were just disturbing a solitary bat. Um, whenever possible, protect natural habitats and provide some water source. Um, again, it's always a good idea to provide some kind of water source because that will attract not just bats, but other wildlife as well. Wherever possible, try to limit your chemical use. And if you want to be a little bit more proactive, you can actually provide a bat house. Um, now, if you're going to provide a bat house, you wanna make sure that it meets certain um, essential requirements. And many bat houses that you'll find um, just at like your local lawn and garden shop or, or places like that do not meet these requirements. So be very, very careful if you get ready to purchase a bat house. Um, and also Bat Conservation International has all of these criteria on their website, as well as instructions on how to build a bat house and possibly some vendors um, that sell bat houses as well. Um, but bat houses should be at least 20 inches tall and 14 inches wide. And multiple chambers is better than a single chamber. And the space, the spacing or the gap for each one of these chambers should be between three quarters and one inch um, wide. That seems really small, but bats are small and they like to be in pretty tight places um, in general. 
Additionally, the boxes should have a landing platform that's three to six inches, that extends three to six inches below the entrance. Now, both of these boxes show screening on the wood. That works, but in over time, that screening will tend to pull away from the wood. Juana will get caught in it, um, and you can get bats and especially pups um, trapped between the wood and the mesh. So a alternative to that would be to actually roughen the wood. You can see on the inside of this box how that wood is scored and that provides a rough enough surface for the bats to hang on to. In this part of the country, the boxes should be painted with a medium stain or um, medium colored paint. That's gonna be darker the further north you are. Um, and that just has to do with um, keeping the box at the right temperature. And then also boxes should have some kind of venting. Usually there's a, a vent along the front of the box and another one along the side, just to allow some air circulation in the chambers. So having a box that size with ventilation essentially allows the bats to move up and down, especially if you've got multiple chambers, um, move up and down within um, along a heat gradient and find where they're most comfortable. It's perfectly acceptable and even recommended to put two boxes back to back. Now you do not want to hang them up on a tree or on a building. You generally are going to want to put them on their own post. Um, now, if you are trying to exclude bats, you have a colony in your attic, say, and you're excluding them, it's okay to put the box next to um, where they're coming out. So maybe they'll move in that. And then you can look at relocating them or relocating that box later. Um, but in general, you do not want to put a, a bat house up on your house. Um, if you can put it up near water, that's ideal, but you want it in the open with um, no obstructions within 20 to 30 feet of the boxes. They also need, the, the bottom of the box needs to be about 12 feet at least off the ground um, because when bats uh, come out of the box, they'll drop and then take off. So you need to have enough room where they can drop and not hit the ground. And they're gonna need to get, uh, the boxes need to have at least six to eight hours of direct sunlight. And so in general, it's recommended that you orient them either south from the southeast to the northeast and have them face that direction. So basically bad houses are not going to, are not a cure-all, okay? You need to have good habitat management um, or good habitat for the bats, but they can provide a, a supplemental roost. Um, they're also not going to um, keep bats from coming into your house. If there's a way that bats can get in, you need to close that off. Um, you need to exclude them. But, well, and then also remember that only a few of our species actually use bat houses. Typically, um, it, it's Brazilian free tails, big brown bats, and evening bats that will use those. And they will, bat houses can provide um, good roosting habitat as long as they meet those criteria. Now, if you put up a bat house, there's no guarantee that it's going to be used. I've got one up at my house that I've had several years and have yet to have any bats in it. Um, but you never know unless you try, and if nothing else, it can be a good conversation starter with your neighbors or friends and provide a chance to, to educate them about the benefits of bats. So with that, um, I'll take any questions that might have come up. Thank you so much, Becky. Um, we do have several questions. Can you hear me? Let me make sure you can, can hear me. Okay, good. Okay, um, wonderful presentation full of information. Um, first question is, are there any bat rehabbers in the area in case a sick or injured one is found? Um, yes, there are several different um, groups that will rehab bats. Um, in Mississippi, I'm not going to be able to pull up the names off the top. There's one that's wild again in Mississippi. I think that's what they're called. They're near Union Lake. There's another up near Arkabutla. Um, and they're, they're, they're some scattered throughout the state. We're working right now on the um, Mississippi Bat Working Group website and also the Facebook page to get links to those rehabbers put up there. Um, 
in the past you've been able to google that and actually find it i don't know if all those links are still good but we are working on getting that on our website and then for tennessee i'll just add that for tennis people in tennessee you probably want to start with the tennessee wildlife resources agency uh, and their website for lists of rehabbers Okay, next question. Are there any known bat colonies in this area? <laughs> um, okay, so we, again, speaking from, from Mississippi, we know of um, a number of um, hibernacula in caves and in culverts. Um, and uh, no maternity roosts too. Um, for obvious reasons, we don't generally give out the locations of those. Um, and I'm not sure, I'm, I mean, I know there's, there's also colonies in, in Tennessee. So short answer is yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay, uh, here's a biology question. How old do bats have to be before they can reproduce? Okay, so most species of bats will um, reproduce their first year. So when they're one year old, I believe gray bats actually have to be two before they can reproduce for the first time. But I, I believe most of our species will reproduce at one. Okay, here's someone uh, with a bat house question. She's had a bat house for quite a while. But, and though they swoop through my yard, they have not roosted. I also have owls. And is that why they do not stay? Not necessarily. Um, as I mentioned, I've had a bat house up for several years too. And um, I've actually had, in the middle of the night, I'll have individual bats come in, into our basement, which is just open. But they're not generally species that use the bat houses. And so most likely, just from, from what I see around my house, um, we have a lot of red bats, which will not use bat houses. So it may be that the, the bats you're seeing are just a species that doesn't use the bat house. Okay. All right, here's another question. How can I attract bats that eat mosquitoes to my yard in East Memphis? What pesticides or chemicals should I avoid spraying? <laughs> um, okay, so to attract bats, um, Think about what, what do bats need. They need a water source. Um, they need some kind of roost area. And they're generally not going to fly um, through real large open areas. Um, I'm not super familiar with Memphis. And so, um, but just in general, you need to think about what, what it is that bats need um, to meet habitat requirements. And try to provide those as much as you can. And then um, I forgot the second part of the question. What oh, pesticides or chemicals should I avoid spraying? Um, I don't know specifically. I would, in general, the, the less chemicals you can use, the better. If you can use um, some sort of natural treatments or, um, you know, when, you're, when you do your garden plantings, try to use companion plant, plants to, um, keep some of the pests away, that sort of thing. Anything that's a little bit more organic is going to be better in terms of um, attracting bats. Yes, and I assume that if insects are have pesticides on their bodies, then that could possibly affect bats eating them. Is that correct? Well, right. And if, I mean, if you're killing all the insects that they want to eat in the first place, then... Right. And... People always talk about bats eating mosquitoes and they will, but they feed on a lot of different insects and different species will kind of specialize. Some seem to prefer moths, some are more beetle feeders. And so um, if you don't have those species around, then it may not be in the bat's best interest to come and forage there. That makes sense. Um, here we go. Why do bats rouse from a torpor? I'm not sure about that, um, quite honestly. It is something that's been documented. Um, in some cases, when they rouse, they will kind of change position within a hypnaculum. Um, you'll see them do some grooming. Um, sometimes they actually will breed um, during those rousal, but 
spouts. Um, and so I don't know if it's any one particular thing or just something that has um, an adaptation that they've, they've had over time that helps them um, adapt to things that might change um, during in, in the hibernaculum during the winter, if it's not in a completely stable environment. But in all honesty, I don't really know. Okay. But uh, a white nose syndrome seems to make them rouse more. Right. Which has, a, which has a, a, a metabolic cost. Is that correct? Right. right. Mm -hmm. And one of the thoughts is that it makes them rouse more because it acts as like an irritant. Um, right. It's like a mosquito bite. You've got to scratch. Right. Um, there's also some indication, I believe, that it um, affects their water balance. And so they wake up and, and um, are getting dehydrated, basically. I see. Okay, um, what kind of vaccine do they use on big brown bats that might be related to your coronavirus? It wasn't a, a vaccine. They basically um, gave the, the bats that um, SARS-CoV-2 virus. They um, they introduced it through both their nose and their throat to see if the bats would um, would keep that virus in their system and to see if they would develop any kind of um, illness or symptoms or or actually be able to pass it to another big brown bat because they were paired and, and one big brown bat was inoculated and the other one was not, but they never found any virus at all in any of the bats. It wasn't, yeah. it wasn't a vaccine, though. It was actually trying to give them the coronavirus. And there are no vaccines right now for, for bats, right? For white nose or anything else, right? Not that as I far know. as I know. Um, and even if there were, it, they have found some, some things that will kill the PD fungus, but... Mm -hmm the administration of that is an issue and trying to put it out there where it doesn't totally change the um the cave itself the habitat itself to where it wouldn't be suitable for bats that's kind of been the the issue with um white nose and any kind of treatment um to kill the fungus itself mm -hmm. okay um do bats have predators um yes um most of the time, most predators or predation um, that I'm aware of would occur on the roost or as bats are emerging from roosts. Um, snakes, raccoons, um, even owls, um, all those things will eat bats. Um, a big issue, well, I don't know about a big issue, but a potentially um, important predator for bats would be house cats um because cats are are like the ultimate predator <laughs> and um if they can catch it then they will and there are, are many instances where um cats have caught bats and it, it doesn't end up good for the bat so right okay um is there any treatment for white nose syndrome i think you yeah they're they're working on it um and like I said, they found some things that will kill the fungus, but being able to apply that without destroying the habitat is a, a major issue at this point. Right, right. Um, and then I, the last question is another bad house question, and maybe we can just reiterate what you said before. I've had a bad house up for about two years and have not seen any activity yet. Any suggestions on how to attract them? Um, and, and with that, you might... Um, look at where your bat house is, whether it's in a large enough opening, whether there's any water nearby, and make sure that your bat house fits those criteria that I listed as far as the size. Yeah, and go to the uh, Bat Conservation International website for some help. Right. And then I, I'm going to finish off with my uh, a question of my own, which is, um, or just a request that you tell people about the Mississippi Bat Working Group and any volunteering opportunities that you might have. Okay. Again. So the, um, the Mississippi Bat Working Group was um, established in 2001. 
Um, and our primary focus is to basically support the efforts of the state um, in bat conservation and education. And so our membership varies from just folks that have an interest in bats to students and, and um, professors to wildlife professionals. Um, we pretty much take anybody that has an interest in bats and um, it's up to you really as far as how involved you might get. Um, we will do educational programs when requested. Um, I try to maintain a list of, of folks who are comfortable presenting. And then we typically have three events every year well, and we just added a fourth event. So um, in January every year, it's, it's usually the first weekend after the new year, um, we'll do a culvert blitz where volunteers will um, be assigned routes of approximately 10 culverts, hopefully near where they live. And um, they'll go through and survey those culverts for bats. Um, and we try to make sure the same culverts are getting surveyed every year so that we can um, try to uh, monitor the population and hopefully we won't see any big declines as a result of um, white nose or anything like that. And so far, um, so far we, we're kind of figure that we're establishing a baseline. Um, we typically have a spring meeting in um, around March um, that's a combination of um, just presentations on works that been work that has been done on bats in in the state or in neighboring states, and also just a business meeting, kind of updating folks with what's going on. And then just this year, we started a um, a bridge blitz, which is actually occurring right now. Um, it's a little bit late for folks to get involved this year, but keep it in mind for next year if you're interested. And it's pattern after the culvert blitz where um, folks are assigned a certain number of bridges and you go out on a certain day during this time frame and look for bats in these bridges. Um, and again, it's it's monitoring, but it's more monitoring our summer roosts, our um, maternity roosts more than the hibernacula. And then um, typically in the late summer or fall, we'll do a mist net event um, in some part of the state to try to um, look at what species we have using or what species um, may be found in that area. The, um, we used to do that in the, the mist net event in the summer. We've started shifting it more and more towards the fall because so much of our bat work has been done in the summertime. And we really want to try to get a handle on some of these species like the silver haired that may migrate through and we just don't have records for them. Um, and so we are going to try to do that Miss Net event this year. We missed it last year because of, of COVID. Um, and um, if anybody is interested uh, and want to find out more information, they can go to our website which is msbats.org and um, we've got a calendar of events and just um, links to different research that's been in the, done in the state and various things like that. Um, I think there's mm -hmm. probably a link to Bat Conservation International there as well. Great. Well, thank you so much, Becky. I really enjoyed your presentation and I hope everyone else did too. So I will uh, wrap up by telling everyone our next lecture is on August 26th about beetles by uh, Dr. Dwayne McKenna at University of Memphis. And uh, please join us for that really, I'm sure it'll be a very interesting talk. Um, also, we've got Greenway activities going on uh, every Saturday. Um, chance to exercise, learn something about nature, um, paddle the Greenway. Uh, those spots are going fast. So just check out our website, wolfriver.org, if you're interested in that. And I uh, also uh, just want to mention, I have a project wet water workshop for educators uh, scheduled for next week on the 21st. Uh, if you know anyone, especially teachers who are interested in a uh, teacher workshop, uh, just go to our website and sign up. So thanks everybody. Um, see you again soon, I hope. Bye. Thanks Kathy for the invite. Thank you, Becky. See you Thank on you, a Becky. fat blitz sometime. <laughs>